Welcome back to Heaven and Healing Podcast. Look at how huge my stomach looks. Look at this baby. She's yeah. so big. Oh my goodness. Okay, well, welcome back. This is our first in-person live stream. First of all, I want to thank my husband, Mike, for setting this all up. Um, yeah. Mike, can we see the, um, the studio, please? <laughs> so Mike did all of this. He actually has... We condensed so that the in-person setup is in the same room as where I do my weekly solo show. Um, so we made everything work in one space as opposed to taking up two rooms in the house, which is helpful. So yeah, I just want to give my husband a shout out because he is worthy to be praised for Yay. this. Thank you, Mike. Um, okay, so today I have my friend, where am I looking? You can put it back on me now. <laughs> We'll figure this out as we go. Today, I have my good friend TJ O'Donnell on the show. I'm so, so, so excited for this. Um, we were just talking about how we got connected. We can never, like, remember exactly how. But I know that it was an answered prayer because um, I had been praying for a couple months. Just, Lord, put someone in me and my husband's life that can kind of disciple us and be a brother and a friend and, like an elder i don't mean that disrespectfully i was even, waiting i was waiting for even that though, <laughs> even though he did get saved the same year i was born i was yeah. two months old but yeah i was praying for that especially for my husband because um you know he's a little bit younger in the faith than me and i can't disciple my husband mm. so it was really a god thing that tj was put in our lives um we I remember meeting him at the Domino Revival premiere, but I don't remember meeting him before that. And then I saw him speak at my friend Taylor's event and where he shared the testimony he's about to share with all of you. Um, he prayed deliverance over someone very close to me. And then we got, we just became friends from there. Let me not knock this over. <laughs> so today I want him to share his testimony of how he got saved. It's a really incredible story. And from there, we're just going to dive into some topics like baptism, deliverance, really just like the totality of salvation. Mm. Um, TJ's been teaching me a lot about the Bible in context, which is, uh, imagine that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Hi, TJ. How's it going? There we there go. There I am. Hey. <laughs> no, I'm really excited to be here. I'm super honored because not only are you a good friend, but... And I don't want to get emotional on this thing, okay? So I'm going to really try not to cry. But um, but I'm a huge fan. I think you do such an amazing job. And just the way you communicate, the way you communicate the gospel, I just see your life in 10 years, and it's amazing, and the impact that you're having. And I am, like, super honored to be an elder, as you would call it, <laughs> or... I, the gray is wisdom, right? Um, but I am. I'm just super honored to be able to to take on that position and be your friend and be part of your family. And Mike's my boy. And uh, I know he works a lot and everything, but you know we're gonna we're gonna kick it soon when he gets a day off. But... My, Mike, are you reading the chat? Yeah. <laughs> Un unhide in the audio mixer. Unhide everything. So, like right click so you can see the cameras are they all off the problem is, is it the two mics picking up each other picking up each other that's the difference can you can actually see the mm -hmm. yeah it's not good. volume isn't good okay does it sound what does it sound like guys it's the outside california um southern california pretty much my whole life Wonderful Tennessee. Um, man, I I grew up. I'm the first Christian. All of my gen first born. Um, I kind of grew up in a home of domestic violence. You know, it wasn't wasn't really that my parents were bad people. Young. Um amazing, wonderful, hot-headed Mexican mama, and my dad, a hot-tempered Irish guy, trying to raise three kids young. 
But, you know, growing up, my house was pretty chaotic and, and uh, endured a lot of domestic violence. We had no God um, really in our life. And, um, you know, so I. I uh, We're cutting out again. Are we cutting out? Why? OK. Yeah, yeah. OK. <laughs> yeah. Why is it choppy? Yeah. Go on. Yeah. So in a nutshell, I mean, um, early on, I, I began to experience just a lot of uh, internal trauma, you know, hearing voices, nightmares, um, just, you know, the, the domestic violence in my home and the fear and, and all that stuff really just kind of started to take a toll on me. And I guess early on, um, you know, I started getting in, in trouble like real early in my elementary days. And, um, you know, that progressively kind of got worse and worse. Um, I think in, in uh, elementary school, you know, I think in kindergarten, I got in trouble for the first time sent to the principal's office. I just had a lot of rage in my life, you know, and, um, you know, those things started to escalate a little bit more and more. And, uh, you know, by the time I got into junior high, um, you know, I, I got into the punk rock movement in the eighties mm. and, um, you know, that was, that was a time where with all the kind of trauma going on in my life and, you know, just, uh, my dad left finally when I was five and I, I really kind of struggled with a lot of rejection and, um, which, you know, when you're young, 13 years old and you got a lot of rage and rejection and hurt that punk rock movement really kind of catapulted me into more of really just a violent, violent person. And, uh, you know, when I got into high school, um, you know, I, I ended up getting into a fight at school and punched a kid and kind of knocked his teeth out and ended up going to juvenile hall for the first time. And then I had a kind of an identity struggle because I'm half white, half Mexican. And I, I decided I was gonna, you know, roll with my Mexican heritage when I, when I got to juvenile hall. So I went through this whole struggle with trying to figure out who I am. And that got me deeper into trouble, getting into gang banging and stuff growing up in high school. But then there was this other part of me that there was a lot of favor on my life. You know, my stepdad, um, was a great guy. He, he was a doctor, very educated man. And, and, uh, he was, you know, always there for me, helping me out and stuff like that. But, um, you know, when I got, uh, um, out of juvenile hall, getting into the, you know, the gang banging thing, just trying to figure out, you know, my way out of this, this stuff. Um, my stepdad really helped me through all that, you know, and uh, because he was an educated guy and my mom, well, you know, I was scared of my mom. So even though I was running amok, being a knucklehead, violent and all that stuff, I still had a healthy fear of my mom. And so I did well in school. Like when I went to juvenile hall, I'd rack up all my credits. Um, and then somehow get back in school. By the time I got back into high school, I actually graduated with a 4.0 <laughs> after going to juvenile hall twice. So there's this like, I still had this favor on my life. Like, I feel like I should have been dead a hundred times growing up. And, um, you know, it just, uh, it was just a crazy kind of journey. And then finally, when I got out of high school, you know, I, didn't really know what to do. Um, you know, I went to college for like two weeks and realized, man, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to school anymore. I just wanted to party and hang out. And, and so basically I, um, you know, worked for a little bit, moved out to Huntington beach, partied a little bit, got over that, moved back home, and then just kind of went on this journey of trying to figure the things out. And then my buddy came to me and back in the nineties, you know, tattooing was kind of becoming a fad and my buddy got apprenticed from a tattoo shop and he became a professional tattoo artist and how are we doing everything cool we're good sound sound is okay yeah and um so you know in this journey of just trying to figure my life out he's like hey why don't you become a tattoo artist you know I was an artist I played music all that stuff and um I'm like yeah I got you know got nothing to lose 
And so I kind of got into this world of, I went through my tattoo apprenticeship. Um, you know, back then tattooing was a little more traditional, like all the tattoo shops were kind of owned by bikers and, you know, you had to go through a, a legit apprenticeship and pay your dues and all that stuff. So I passed with flying colors. I started tattooing and I actually started doing really well. I think I was 20 years old at the time, 19. Um, and then, uh, you know, some of our other buddies apprenticed and now we got, you know, four buddies out of high school, um, working at a tattoo shop with all the freedom in the world with no God in my life. And I'm like, I think I'm living the life. We actually had a term called living the life because we made cash money. We partied whenever we want and all that good stuff. And like, um, we ended up all getting a place together in Riverside and because we, you know, played punk rock music, played in a band and all that stuff. I never messed with like super hard drugs growing up. You know, I smoked weed and got exposed to, you know, alcohol and weed and stuff when I was like eight and nine years old. So that was always kind of just a part of life, but never really dove into like hard, hard drugs and, and anything like that. Um, but we were up one night, you know, jamming, playing music, probably one in the morning. And one of my buddies, you know, busted out a bag of speed. And I never liked speed because I, you know, a lot of my buddies did speed and they looked all tweaky and crazy. And I was like, I never want to be like that, you know. Um, but I wanted to stay up and have fun with my friends. And so, you know, I decided I'm going to dip into the bag, grab a rock and drink it with my beer. I thought, well, that's kind of cool. I'm not going to snort it like those kind of people. And, you know, it's funny how you still have morals in the drug world. But, um, but anyway, so I, I downed this rock with my beer and man, it, it was like a game changer, like in the worst way. Um, I never experienced any, anything like that, you know? So I got super high. Um, and that just literally opened the door for a road to destruction for me. Like I was, I'm not, I wasn't typically like an addicted person. I don't think like I had a cigarette habit, but I didn't think of myself as really an addictive type person. But man, when I did that speed, uh, it just, it just hooked me. And so, you know, I got on this vicious cycle now with my friends of, you know, trying to keep it in the closet a little bit, but you know, next thing you know, it's not enough, you know, and then I'm, now I'm snorting it. Now my morals are starting to dwindle, you know what I mean? And, um, so probably, I don't know, maybe a year in, um, I was partying at a, at a hotel and some, some older dudes, some convicts got out of prison and, um, you know, they, they brought the hard stuff and, I don't know why I just was sitting there watching these dudes pull the rigs out and all that stuff. And something inside of me was just like, just do it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I did, I took my first shot of dope. Um, and that was another game changer, like a whole different ball game. Um, tried to stay in the closet on that. Cause most of my friends didn't mess around like that, but man, I went on a journey uh, for another year of addiction, like with slam and dope. And, um, you know, I finally ended up kind of living on the streets. Um, long story, uh, a lot of details, but in a nutshell, uh, a cop woke me up one time when I was sleeping on the streets and he's like, Hey man, you can't be sleeping here. And I woke up in a daze and he's like, he just looked at me. He's like, man, you need some help. Can I help you? And I just kind of shook it off. I'm like, no, 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 I'm good. And I took off. And as I was walking away, something hit me like, man, I, I'm either going to die or something bad is going to happen here, you know? So I never wanted to go to my parents with this, but, um, I was like, man, I need help, you know? So basically went and told my mom, broke her heart, you know, I'm on drugs, told her the whole situation. Um, they put me in rehab and I don't know, something in rehab was trippy for me. Like I never, when I got to rehab, I kind of like, I detoxed and it was rough. Like that was horrible detoxing. And then as I got, I began to program in there, I started just like looking around going, man, what is this? You know, I don't want to call myself an addict for the rest of my life. Like, I don't know why that was so important to me at the time. And then I look around and I, and I, 
you know, see them kind of like falling off the wagon and they're all, all in this cycle, you know, and I'm like, man, is this just going to be a temporary thing for me? And then they're trading like one addiction for the other. They're like chimney smoking and coffee. And I'm like, man, there's got to be a, a better way, you know? And then in the middle of all that, I started missing my friends. And so I left the rehab, um, you know, went back to my neighborhood and just didn't know what to do. So I tried to leave the state. I tried to leave the city and a lot of details in the midst of all that. But, um, at the end of the day, um, I finally reached out to my, my dad, my real dad. And, um, you know, I, I had another healthy fear of my, my real dad. He's a great guy, like business owner, owns automotive shop and all that stuff. I just never really wanted to disappoint him either, you know, but, um, but I went to him and I'm, and I'm like, I don't know what to do, man. Like I'm on this vicious cycle, you know, can I come and live with you and work for you? And that's all I could think, you know, and he just kind of looked at me. He's like, yeah, come on, man. You know, like I'll give you a shot. So, um, so I moved, he lived in another city, I moved with my dad and, um, I was actually doing really good. You know, I got clean for, for the first time for like a few months and I started running in his automotive shop and like helping out there and, and things were going good. And I was kind of living in his little garage thing that he had on the side of his house. And, um, you know, a couple months, things were going good. And then of course I run into some friends, run into some people. And next thing you know, that door opens again and I slip up and now I'm back in the closet and I'm thinking I could be functional right now. So I tried doing the functional thing, you know, I'll just try to regulate this thing. And, um, so I did that for, I don't know, maybe a month or so. And then, and then I started falling asleep like at work because I'd been up for a couple days and we're dealing with automotive stuff like with lifts and all this other stuff. So it was pretty dangerous, man. I, there was a couple close calls where I was like falling asleep and cars are almost falling on me. I'm like, I don't know what to do, man. Like, and, um, so about that time, there's a, there's a fair that happens every year in this, in this town. And, um, it's called the Norco fair. So I lived in Norco, California. Um, it's, it's really North Corona. So it's kind of interesting because I always struggled with my identity, you know, like I'm half Mexican, half white. And you know, I have my Cholo days and then my punk rock days. And I'm like, who am I? But, um, Corona is kind of like, they call it crown towns, Latino. There's a lot of Chicanos, you know, gangbangers. I had some homies that lived there, you know, and then, but I'm living in Norco, right? So Norco is Cowtown. This is nothing but cowboys. So it's, it's a totally different culture, two different cultures right next to each other. I'm working in Corona, living in Norco. It's like my life identity crisis. And, um, the Norco fair, everybody goes right. Uh, and there's always things that jump off because there's a lot of drinking and the Latinos and the Cowboys always get into fights and everything. And so anyway, um, I ran into a homeboy of mine, um, that I used to actually gangbang with. And, uh, he's like, Hey bro, you know, I was talking to this girl and there's a party tomorrow night right here in Norco. I've been up a couple of days. I don't know if I can go another day, you know, but all right, bro, I'll pick you up, you know? So, uh, I end up, the next day, man, I was still up feeling weird, but I didn't want to let the homie down. So I drove out there, had my little 77 Cadillac all dialed in, gangstered out, slammed out. And, um, I go pick him up. We jam back to Norco and we pull up to this party. And I mean, it's a massive house party. So, I, I mean, you've probably been to massive house parties. I mean, there's people everywhere. It's kind of like, you know, I never partied much. Actually. No, 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 no. I I've been to a couple parties, but I was always a homebody. I would much rather have just like smoked weed in my bedroom all night. Okay. So that was more my scene. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would have probably been dead if that was me, <laughs> you know, way. I mean, that's like, yeah, I'd have been in the closet horrible at that point. 
But anyway, I, I, so basically we pull up to this house party and we pull in and the house that the party's at is actually in a cul-de-sac and there's a street that's going this way. And so I kind of swoop in, there's cars everywhere. I pull in, I pull around, I park right at the end of that street. And so we get out and we're all gangstered out. Like I got my beanie, you know, my Pendleton and SoCal vibes, you know, SoCal uh, Chicano style. And we, we roll in uh, to this party and I realize immediately that we're totally out of place. Um, there's not one person like us in this place. It's all cowboy party. I'm like, I've been up a couple of days and I'm kind of tripping, you know, a little bit. My buddy, he's just focused on this girl, right? And he connects with this girl and I'm like sitting there feeling crazy, you know, like this is not good. So I decide to go back out to my car and just wait it out, right? So I go back out to my car, do a little bit of dope to kind of straighten up a little bit. And as I'm sitting there, um, I noticed, you know, about five very large cowboy dudes in the parking lot drunk and kind of messing with people going in and out of the party, you know? And I don't know, I was just sitting there like tripping on these dudes. And, you know, at that time I always made sure I carried my tattoo equipment cause I, I would do mobile tattooing too on the side. And, um, I always carried my tattoo equipment. I always had a little bit of money. So I always carried a revolver with me just for protection, you know? And so I thought, you know what? This is not good, man. I'm just stewing on these dudes. We need to get out of here, but I don't want to leave my buddy hanging. So I'm going to go in and get him and tell him, let's get out of here. So, but I decide I'm going to pack my gun. And, uh, and so I pack my gun. I start walking up to the party and these, uh, these five drunk dudes, man, one, one of them throws something at me and starts laughing. And I just, I just lost it. I just like, I didn't want to kill nobody or hurt anybody, but I'm like, these guys are messing with the wrong dude. I'm not in the mood. I walked up, I showed them I'm packing a gun and they were not phased. Mm -hmm. They were drunk and they start taunting me and they're like, so what, what are you going to do with that? You know? And I'm like, what am I going to do? You know, it's like, crazy situation. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just scare them, you know? So I pulled the gun out, popped off a couple rounds, to try to back them off. Well, of course now shots fired. The whole party is now in disarray because shots are fired. People are running crazy except for the drunk dudes. You know, now they're starting to come towards me like, come on, use it big guy and all this other stuff. And I'm like, crap, what do I do? You know? So I don't know. In a moment, I just kind of snapped. I, picked out the biggest dude. I pointed the gun and bam, I pulled the trigger. I could see the fire come out. I see this dude go, Oh shoot. I mean, he's standing right there. Uh, his buddies look at me and it's like all in slow motion. I'm like, Oh, what did I just do? You know, like I literally just shot a dude in front of this whole party. I'm like crap. Then my senses kick in. I'm like, I got to get out of here. So I start moving towards my car and, uh, I get to my car and this is where things even got crazier. So I get to my car, I open the door, I sit down, I'm looking for my keys. I put my gun on my lap and I had a revolver and I can hear his buddies say, let's go get that dude. Let's go get him. Next thing I know, this dude's pulling right here at my, my driver's side door and my windows down like that far. And out of pure reaction, I just grabbed the revolver. I put it to his head and I just went click, click, click. And I, and I pulled the trigger three times and the gun didn't go off. Wow. And like, I didn't think about it in the moment, obviously. But as I look back, I'm like, my God, that's a revolver. They don't jam. I only lit off a couple rounds. I had plenty of rounds in there. You know what I mean? It was almost like God had his finger on the trigger and was like, no, dude, <laughs> it's not going to happen like that. Well, this dude starts to realize he almost got his head blown off. He jumps in my side door and I pistol whip the dude. I hit him hard with the gun and knocked him out. So I'm pushing this guy off. I drop my gun, my wallet's in there. And by the time I push myself out of the, the passenger door to get out to run, I got cops everywhere. Now I look back and I see sirens coming and I'm like, oh man. So I'm, I'm booking it, right? hitting down this street 
and I'm at a dead end road and there's like this huge ivy wall. And I don't know, man, I just supernaturally scaled this wall, jumped into a field and it was like being on cops, man. I'm just like, I'm on the run, jumping yards, feeling crazy, been up for days. I'm going through trees. I just remember going through these orange and lemon trees and feeling spider webs all over me feeling like I had spiders on me. I'm freaking out helicopters. Um, now I'm hearing, you know, dogs and all this stuff. And in the middle of that, I just, I, I look in the distance and I see this little white shed. And I just remember thinking, I don't know, man, I feel like if I can get to the shed, I'm going to be safe, you know? So I, I plow through the trees. I, I run to the shed and I cram myself in. There's completely pitch black. And I'm sitting there trying to catch my breath and I can hear the helicopters above. Now I'm hearing dogs, you know, and voices all around. And in that moment, everything stopped. And I just, almost like a video replay, saw my life in a, in a flash. And um, I, I just saw every person I hurt, everything I did to ruin my life. Um, I saw the pain I caused my mom and I just, I just broke, man. Like in the middle of chaos, it was like this repentant moment of like, I just blew it. And then out of nowhere, I felt this presence that you can't convince me. Otherwise it was the greatest comforting feeling I've ever felt. And the only way I could describe it is it's gotta be God. So I said, God, listen, if this is you and you can get me out of this mess and make all this go away, I'll just give you my life. It's the last thing I remember. I just passed out in the middle of all that. It's the last words I remember. I woke up four hours later and I was free. And as I sat there in the dark, I'm like, what just happened, you know? So I get out and I'm like, it's four o'clock in the morning. It's like twilight zone. I'm like, oh my God, this is real. But the last thing I remember was that prayer. And so now I'm like, what do I do? You know? So I run to my buddies. They're all up tweaking. I'm like, I just shot a dude, man. I don't know what to do. You know, it's, it's crazy. And man, for the next couple of days, I'm just wrestling what to do. And then finally I just said, you know what? Okay, God, what do you want me to do? <laughs> now you set me free, but what do I do now? And I just remember distinctly, I never read a book, never read the Bible, never read, you know, and, and and now I know it was like the old Matthew 6.33 that God just said, listen, do the right thing and I'll take care of all the details. That was, that was the voice that I heard. I knew it wasn't my voice. I knew it wasn't the devil's voice. I knew the devil's voice. And I said, man, I don't know if I kill this guy. I don't know what is going on, but I'm going to trust that voice, right? And um, I end up going and telling my dad what I did. He freaked out called my uncle, who's a detective. He's like, you got to take him down to the station. And so I go, I go down to the station and they're like, good thing you turned yourself in. There was already like a write up in the paper. They had my gun, they had my wallet. Like I was not a good criminal, you know what I mean? And, uh, so they're like, good thing you turned yourself in. You know, the, fortunately the guy didn't die. So I was being charged with attempted murder. Um, so they put me in handcuffs. They took me to jail. And the worst thing about, you know, I've been in jail several times, but this time the, the struggle was, I didn't know what I was looking at. You know what I mean? So you're in there the whole time and I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I tried reading the Bible at that time and it was like hard, like King James version started from Genesis. <laughs> I'm like, what is this stuff? Uh, but I started praying. You know, I started just saying, God, I need help. You know, I need to understand these things. And I started, then people started coming to me, dropping little terms like, you know, saved and sanctified and these Bible words that I know now, but I didn't know then. I'm like, what is this? It's interesting, but it, it piqued my interest, you know? And um, so, you know, I go to prison and now I have a choice to make because I'm a young tattoo artist who shot a dude uh, in prison. And, and, you know, that's kind of clout. Like I could make something of this, you know, I could, I could actually be somebody in prison. You know, I've already shot somebody. Um, I'm a tattooer. 
it's like a hustle in there, you know, like, um, so it was, a, it was a wrestling and I'm a young guy and you got to prove yourself in prison. So I end up, um, uh, you know, taking care of some business on the yard, we call it. In other words, you know, uh, it's super racial in there, which is awful. Um, so I'm half Mexican, half white. And I'm like, you know, but I, you know, my last name is O'Donnell. You know, when I was gang banging, I just got tired of the homies being all like, Hey, O'Donnell, what's up, homie? You know, like, eh, it just doesn't sound right. You know what I mean? So I just rode with the white dudes on this one. And, uh, anyway, there was a dude that was, you know, out of line, um, with some racial stuff and I had to go beat him up and all this stuff. And so I got thrown in the hole and, um, so being in the hole was hard because I was in isolation, you know, for 20 days or 10 days. And, uh, I didn't like being alone, you know, and plus I'm in a little cell. Well, the only thing that's in there is a Bible. You're in a jumpsuit and you have a little piece of pen to write with and they feed you through the slot. You're in there 22 hours a day, you know, but I'm going to tell you something. That was one of the most powerful, intimate, times that I spent because I started reading the Bible and things started to make sense to me for some weird reason. I'm these and the thou's and the those and the old King James Bible. I'm starting to like translate almost, you know? And, um, finally, um, you know, 10 days in it's overcrowding. So they're now going to allow me to have a cellmate. And, uh, I get this cellmate that comes into my cell and he's like, this tore up little skinny, bad hair, bad tattoos, bad teeth. He was a heroin addict. Um, actually the guy was going to die of AIDS. They were sending him to Vacaville. He was just in transition, but the guy had no fear. Like there was something different about this dude. Some, I, I almost sometimes think it was an angel. I don't know. But anyway, this guy came into my cell. He saw me reading the Bible and he's like, Hey, can I show you a few things in there? I'm like, yeah, man. I told him the shed story, told him about my journey. He's like, man, I, you know, I was, I went to school to be a pastor. I grew up a Christian. I got hooked up with some bad people, got hooked on drugs and I can understand that, you know? And, um, he said, but I'll tell you, I know a lot about the Bible. And, and I said, well, yeah, show me please. So he took me to the book of Romans. He started explaining to me, he's all like, God, you're talking to, he actually came to this earth. That's Jesus Christ. And he actually paid the penalty for all the sins of the world. He paid the penalty for everything you did and he died and he conquered death. He rose from the dead and he did that for you. And I just freaking floor, it just floored me. You know, it was like that hit me like a ton of bricks. And I'm like, that God I'm talking to, that's Jesus Christ. Like I tattooed a Jesus on my chest, you know, but I had no clue the correlation or, or any of that stuff. And I'm like, wow, okay. That's what I've been looking for my whole life. So the God of the universe came to this earth, recognized I had issues and was willing to die on a cross and get buried, but in power rise from the dead to conquer death and said, Hey, I'll give you a brand new life. If you choose me. And I'm like, I choose you. I just started bawling. I'm like, what do I do? He's all, let's pray. So he got me on my knees. We um, prayed, received Christ into my life. And I'm telling you, you know, I the sky didn't crack open. I didn't, it's like, there's nothing crazy, but I could just felt a thousand pounds just lift off my shoulders, yeah. you know? And I knew things were different. And like, my language was F-bomb. Like, that was my language. And instantly my... Every time I dropped an F-bomb, I'd be like, whoa, that's weird. And I don't know why I just changed. You know, I wasn't trying to. I'm not judgy. I'm just saying it's just something changed in me. Um, yeah, that language. Like, I, I told you before we started recording, I've been watching my old podcast. And it's like every other word. I'm like, F this, F that, F, F, F. And it's like, it like makes me cringe. It's so disgusting. Yeah. And it's so normal in the world to just talk like that. And well, you don't even yeah. like realize that you talk like that until no, just, you have the Holy Spirit. Totally. Well, and the Bible says out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, and what people don't understand is words are very, very powerful. Jesus Christ is the word. Mm -hmm. 
So when those words were designed for a purpose to mm. curse, yeah. those are curse words. And we don't realize right. that when we're doing that, we're actually bringing forth a curse because we, we live in a kingdom realm. There's king, you know what I mean? There's legal rights and different things that give the enemy authority over your life. And so when, when your language is placing those curses, it's keeping the curse alive mm. in your life. So anyway, that's just a little side note. We'll but, get into the legal rights thing. Yeah. So keep going. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so I, I wish I could tell you that everything was hunky-dory and, you know, everything, but the, it was a crucial moment. And, um, you know, I never been to church. I went to Catholic church a few times. No family members as believers. I had this girlfriend um, that I hooked up with before I went to prison. I made sure I kept her number, you know, we kind of hooked up and, um, you know, before I paroled, I told her, I was like, Hey, this sounds weird. Cause she's partying still no God in her life. I'm like, I had this experience, you know, with God and I, I want to go to church. Like, can you find a church? So she found some late service, you know, cause she's hung over <laughs> and just went through the phone book and found a church. And, uh, and so when I got out, you know, um, I went to church for the first time and I'll be honest, it was, it was hard. It was my first church experience was walking in the door with a slingshot, you know, like a wife beater shirt, tattoos, my hat backwards. I had no clue of protocol and an usher confronting me and telling me to take my hat off and have some respect. And it took everything inside of me not to punch this. I just came from a place where <laughs> respect is earned. You know what I'm saying? And now I read the book of Acts. I don't know how many times when I was, you know, in, in isolation and like in prison. So I'm thinking when I get out, I'm going to have this family. We're going to have a, re you know, it's going to be, you know, like this reunion. They're going to love on me. And like, mm. it was just not my experience, you know? And so. Mm. Um, I had to work through that and, but God was speaking to me strong. I just felt like God was saying, you know what, just chill, sit down, listen and learn. That's really what God put in my heart is just sit down, listen and learn. And as I looked around, I remember God showing me these people need you just as much as you need them. So I need you to chill out. And, uh, that was a game changer for me because I didn't want to go back to my old life, but this was definitely a different culture for me, you know, from, from where I came. And so, um, you know, so I got into the church life and you know, start playing music and um, they start hearing my story. It's kind of a mega church. And so right away, you know, they're like, and you got to tell your story, you know, your testimony, they called it. And, um, you know, we, we feel like you're called to be an evangelist. And I'm just like wanting to be accepted, you know, like, okay, whatever. Like, that sounds great. I'll do whatever. I love Jesus. I want to tell people about Jesus. So anyway, um, you know, they put me through school, which is awesome. You know, I went to two, two and a half years of lay leadership training, started a ministry there, reaching out to my old knucklehead friends and like meeting in garages and like, cause they wouldn't go to church or whatever. So early on, I was telling people about Jesus. Like that was my thing. You know, I was still not a hundred percent. I was still a little bit jacked up. But I always, you know, Vinnie Bruno, I'll, I'll never forget, man, um, when he led me to Christ. After he prayed with me, he just kind of leaned back on the cell wall. And he's like, man, I can't believe God would still use me. And that always stuck with me, you know what I mean? Because he was kind of jacked up, you know. But he led me to Christ. So it's hard because, like, the guy that led me to Christ was pretty jacked up. You know, and um, and so... I tend to have a lot of grace on people um, where they're at. I don't compromise truth. And, and, and if you know me, you know I'm not going to compromise the truth. But I'm going to still be there for you. I'm still hang with you. And I still want to be a good influence. But I'm not going to compromise the truth. But you know what I mean? I'm not going to bail on you or whatever. Right. So anyway, am I cool? Is this good? Or Yeah. yeah good. I can keep talking. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I finally, um, married that girl, you know, she, <laughs> that's a whole nother ball game, whole nother story. We had a kid and all that stuff. There's a whole a lot of detail in there, but you know, then I really got into doing ministry. You know what I mean? So now I'm, I go back to work for my dad 
I'm working in the automotive shop. It's all brand new for me. I'm young. Now she's having a baby. I'm like, dude, I'm 24 years old, got out of prison, changed my life to Christ. I'm now having to run my dad's shop. I'm at new this church thing, like ministry stuff. It was, it was a lot. And I had gotten this chick pregnant before I went to prison. Um, and I knew I had a kid out there somewhere, you know, so that was an issue. And then of course, um, I tried to find her back in the day and that was a whole nother long story, but that broke my heart. I knew I had a kid out there. And so I, I'm like this young guy with all this new stuff going on. And in the middle of all this, this ex-girlfriend comes with this kid that I have from the past. And it was just like bad, you know? Um, but God really helped me through all that stuff, man, and, and carried me through. Because I'd be back in prison, I think, because that's a lot of weight to carry without God's help, you know? And um, and so, you know, I got into ministry, uh, became a pastor. And then uh, there was a young church, cool church, that was meeting at that church at night. And they started a, um, their own thing, you know. And um, he asked me to come share my testimony at a men's conference thing and so I did, and it was amazing. And so I ended up becoming the outreach pastor there. Uh, it was a great season. I was there for seven years, um, leading people to Christ, all my friends. Like, it was a great movement. We had a movement called Triple Seven Church, or Triple Seven Souls at the time. And then I went on to plan a church uh, after that called Triple Seven Church. And that was an amazing experience. But I still had I still had some, some damage. You know what I mean? Like, um, I grew a lot, but there were still things in my life that were, were damaged, you know, and, and I took that into ministry too. And so when I planted my church, it was such a, a cool radical thing because I was reaching a segment of society that the church really wasn't like, you know, um, the metal militia, freestyle motocross, Brian Deegan, Ronnie Feist, like baptizing these guys, ministering to these guys. I'm thinking I'm cool, you know, tap out the UFC fighters we're meeting in a nightclub, you know, and I was kind of taught in church that, Oh, you're reaching the, the cool crowd. So you're cool. And I kind of built an identity on that. And I, I, I planted triple seven church on seven, seven of Oh seven. So like, how often does that happen? I'm like, it's a God thing, you know, like, so like everything was aligned and, you know, I had this thriving, amazing church. People are getting saved. Um, and, uh, and then weirdness started happening. My wife started kind of tripping. This couple came to the church that was kind of strange. And next thing you know, I'm kind of experiencing my wife kind of flirting with a guy at church. And I'm like a young pastor trying to hold all this stuff together and in denial and all this other stuff, you know. And at the end of the day, three years into the church plan, it comes out that she cheated on me. And um, I was wrecked, you know. Um, I was so hurt and rejected. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't minister, couldn't preach. I basically just turned my church over, you know, yeah. um, the denomination that was helping us was the Southern Baptist convention, you know, was, was helping us out. And, you know, we talk about charismatic evangelical, I, you know, at the time I, I read the Bible so many times and like sought after the gifts of the spirit. So I, I got baptized in the spirit. I'm speaking in tongues as a Southern Baptist. Nobody else really is, but I, but I am, you know what I mean? Um, and so, uh, I don't know why, why am I telling you that? Why did I, why did I veer off on that one? Um, yeah. What was I, what was I telling you about that? Oh yeah. Okay. Man, I'm trying to forget that still. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, uh, Come to find out, yeah, I was I was wrecked, man. Um, and you couldn't do anything. Yeah, the denomination couldn't help me. So this is like the fall from grace. Yes, yes. Um, you know, I had thought I had arrived. You know, like like when I first started going to church, I look at the guy on the stage. I'm like, okay, I guess that's where you have to. I'm a driven dude. I'm an entrepreneur. You know, like I guess that's where you go. You know, and I felt like, hey, this is I'm, I've arrived. And then when that happened, like. Yeah, I was wrecked. I lost everything, you know, mm. My, um, lost everything. And the weird thing is, is like, I didn't cheat or anything. 
but somehow even my kids were turning on me in this season. It was really a dark season. And I, I didn't want to go back to my old, you know, automotive life because when I became a pastor, like I pastored full time, you know, it was like 12 years in 10 years in. And like, I'm accustomed to this life. I'm like, I'm not going back to the automotive thing. You know, I was a little stubborn at that. So I'm like, well, I'm going to open a tattoo shop clothing store and use it for outreach. That was dumb. You know, I was like one of the dumbest things I ever did. Um, and, uh, I did it. I built out this amazing tattoo shop, had all these cool artists, you know, pastor TJ, like doing, you know, it's like, but now we're promoting in the clubs and we're like trying to build up this thing and yeah. I'm backsliding. Right. Like bad. Yeah. You know, I'm hurt backsliding, sleeping around, like all the bad stuff. Like I did, wasn't doing drugs, but, and then I met my angel, my wife. Shauna. So, um, she, you know, like she's here and she, I think she's here. Yeah. Um, you know, I could, I could spend all night talking about that, but let's just say it was a game changer and we really connected on a, on a totally different level. And, um, I knew in my heart that that wasn't the life for me and I needed to get back to my purpose. And she honestly wasn't even a believer at the time. So I've done everything wrong. Okay. I'm just mm -hmm. saying, this is the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't mean to, I, it's not, I wouldn't recommend it, but, um, it, yeah. it is what it is, man. And, and like, all I can say is, um, I mean, I give God, that's why I'm such a Jesus freak. And I love the Lord, man, because I've been down and out, you know, and, and I do know that it's him that has guided me and gotten me through all this crap, you know? And so, Anyway, I, you know, I got back on the horse, started going back to church and I was, dude, I was a mess. My poor like girlfriend at the time was like patting me on the back. I'm snot bubbling, like just a wreck. And, um, you know, we walked through that season, um, finally ended up leading her to Christ, baptizing her. We get back into church. We're like, you know, and so now she's in yeah. this thing with me. Yeah. Um, I'm on this journey, but I'm still struggling with some things, you know, like we're trying to get plugged back into church, but there's a lot of rejection. Yeah. And I try to go back to the church where I was pastoring an outreach pastor. Well, now I'm showing up with a hot blonde and nobody knows the the real story. <laughs> you know, like, oh, that's just TJ. It must, you know, like they didn't know that all this stuff happened to me really. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of uncomfortable. And like, so I just felt like it was a distraction. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell that story about, um, when you were in traffic. Oh no. That's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> oh no. Well, cause that opened like that, that opened the, the barn doors to like deliverance ultimately. Right. Um, are you talking about the pastor TJ story? Yeah. Or, oh my gosh. Well, that's <laughs> when I was, that's when I was actually pastoring to have my church. Um, oh, that was back then. Yes. Oh, well, that's a good, you got it. You got it. Well, but, but so this is the, okay. So this is like, I'm pastoring, but i still have issues. Right. So I still have major anger, right. Rage, mm -hmm. um, to where now I know as a spirit, uh, I had rejection really bad. Um, and we'll get to that, but the story you're talking about, I took my little daughter to the snow in Southern California, went to big bear. We're coming back trying to get on the freeway in Redlands and it's bottlenecked and this dude's not letting me in. Right. And I'm <laughs> terrible road rage. So basically he's not letting me in and I'm freaking out. Well, now everything stops and I'm like, okay, I get out of the car. I walk around and I'm going to punch this dude. And he looks at me and he goes, Mr. TJ. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm all, Hey man, you're trying to kill somebody. And then a cop pulls up and is all, Hey, get back in your car. And I'm like, okay, God, I get it, man. I get it. Like, why can't I overcome this? This is so stupid, you know? So, but that was, you know, um, we try to paint the picture that pastors have it all together and everything. Mm. A lot of pastors have a lot of bondage. Mm. They just cover it. Um, I just was never the type of person that could cover it real well. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, um, so back to, where were we? <laughs> well, I thought, I thought that came later. Uh -uh. I thought Shauna was in the picture when that happened already. No, was, no, it was uh, another time. That okay. was before. Okay. No, that was, that was when I, I beat up the guy 
that was uh, made my son cry. Was that the one? I don't think you told me about that one. Oh no. <laughs> TJ's hurt a lot of people. Yeah, but it, yeah, but I, yeah, but <laughs> I didn't mean to. <laughs> my wife, my my wife has an ex husband that is one of the gnarliest dudes, like the the gnarliest fruit tester. In the in one of the darkest times of my life, like this person is in my life. I have my ex, this ex, and me and my wife. I'm telling you, if we could get through our our scenario, there's a God in heaven. I'm just telling you. Mm. Um, it took everything inside of me to not kill her ex husband, mm. and so my ex wife had this boyfriend, right? Well, they came out of the closet. The guy she was cheating on me with came out of the closet, so now they're a thing. And they move my kids into a compound like this house with a bunch of her friends and everything. I'm like, oh, my God. So anyway, my daughter comes over for the weekend. She's like, Dad, Colin, who's the where she moved into, the lady that owned the house, her boyfriend, I knew. He was kind of a friend. He was a younger guy. And so my daughter's all, hey, Colin got in Stephen's face and made him cry because the dogs were fighting. I'm like, Really? She's like, yeah, dad, like, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh my God, please no. Okay, I'm going to, sh- I'm. this is, a- it's going to be okay. I'm, you know, and a couple of weeks went by and I wasn't even thinking about it anymore. My son texted me. He's like, hey, dad, can I have some money? 20 bucks for a game or something. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll come by. So I dropped by there to drop him off some money and that guy answers the door. And I'm like, okay, he's kind of a friend. I'm like, what's up, Colin? How you doing, man? And I thought I was just going to be man to man and go, hey, Listen, if my son gives you a problem, just call me, dude. Mm. You know, he's he's young. He's like, and he got weird on me. He's like, <laughs> what, dude? He like flexed on me. He's like, what are you what are you talking about? Like, blah, blah, blah. He started getting in my face. And like, now, like people are coming out of the house and I'm feeling like, oh, crap. It's like high school again at three o'clock and everybody's here to watch. And I snapped and I just dropped this dude like. I don't know, man. I lost it. And so I'm like, who am I? You know what I mean? I'm like, I still have issues is the point. Mm -hmm. Um, Was there always like (laughs) heaviness after that for you? Like, did you feel super convicted? Yes. And like godly sorrow over that kind of stuff? I did. In fact, when I dropped the dude, right, he fell and I, I grabbed him on the ground and I couldn't hit him anymore. And I started realizing, what am I doing? And the boyfriend of my ex-wife tries to jump on my back to get me off of him. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> dude. I tell him, I'm like, oh, bro, it's taking everything inside me not to kill this guy. Please get off my back or I will kill you right now. Like literally. And he like backed off and I shook it off. But yeah, I felt horrible. Yeah. I felt horrible, you know? And I'm like, what is the deal? Anyway, so we navigate through that. Things are starting to get better. I wind up at a little church plant away from everybody, but it's a church plant. And now I'm feeling pressure to get back into doing ministry and teaching and do all that stuff. And it just, it just was not good because I wasn't ready at the time. Like, um, you know, people from my old church are starting to come. They want me to do my own thing again. And so we venture off, try to do a little thing. And I'm like, this is not right. I I don't feel good. Like I want to go back to the church where we were. And then the leader, some of the leadership was like, he's trying to steal sheep and all this, you know, it's all this rejection. It's all rejection. And I get a text message from a friend of mine in another city where I planted my church because now I'm living back in Riverside. My church was in San Bernardino that I planted. And I connected with a pastor in San Bernardino um, because we just had the same heart to reach the city and reach people. And he's a Latino preacher, fire preacher. Like I'd go listen to him. Um, when I had my church just to get myself fed, you know, they had a night service and I kind of lost touch with them. And then a friend of mine was texting me that had been going to his church. And I'm like, maybe I need to go visit Pastor Marco, you know, like, I don't know. I feel like we need to go pay him a visit. So me and Shauna packed up one night. We went out to visit Pastor Marco. And immediately when I walked into the, and this is in the inner city, this is the hood. It's a mega church, but you know, it's, 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 it's different. And the spirit of God was so strong there, man. Like we just knew we were in the right place. And after service, normally he would be on the altar praying or go back to his back room or whatever, but just so happens that he was by the door and I ran right into him 
And he's like, dude, where have you been? Like, you know, we just kind of caught up. He's like, you got to come, you got to come uh, see me. Mm. He said, in fact, come see me tomorrow in my office. I'm like, mm. yeah, no problem. So I go see Pastor Marco and he just sits at his desk. He just tells, tell me about your life, you know, tell me what's going on. Tell me about your whole life. I'm like, okay, well, here we go. You know, I've struggled, you know, early on in domestic violence, fear, you know, uh, raids, trauma, like all this stuff, mental stuff. Um, and he's just listening to my whole story of everything that happened up to where I was at at that point. And when I was done, he was taking notes the whole time I was done. He kind of put the notepad down and he looked at me and it was the craziest thing. I never experienced anything like that. Like, and he said, you, what's happening is you have a spirit of rejection that came in when you were five years old mm -hmm. and it's causing all these circumstances for you to be rejected and nobody notices it. And my stomach began to ball up. Wow. And I'm like, oh my God, what's happening? This happened to me before when somebody prayed for me before and I didn't know what it was and I fought it off. I'm like, uh-uh, uh-uh, mm -mm. this is too weird. I'm going to shake it off, you know? So a little caveat to that. It mm -hmm. When there's like a familiar, like, ex I don't know, what's the word, um, sensation like that, like a familiar feeling in the body mm -hmm. that's like kind of like inexplicable, is that usually like a spirit in your experience? Yeah. 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 And, we, and we'll go deeper into that because the, the spirit is not, it, it, it's in the soul mm -hmm. and the body. It's not in the, in your spirit. Right. But so, yeah, it affects your emotion. It's, you know, tied in the belly and the gut. There's, depending on how deeply rooted things, well, I had some deep roots. You know, some people, they're, they're you know, they have some stuff there, but it's not deeply rooted and it's mm -hmm. real simple. It's real easy. But, you know, when you have some deeply rooted stuff, like there's more, reaction I've found a lot of times, but, but I'd literally begin to ball up and I started feeling a little nauseous and he jumped over the desk. He knew exactly what was going on. He just began commanding spirit of rejection. You come out, loose him right now. Like he's a, he started prophesying. He's an evangelist, you know, under the authority of Jesus Christ. And I start dry heaving and I hate throwing up. Like <laughs> throwing up was a phobia of mine. Right. So, which was a spirit, <laughs> another yeah. spirit. Yeah. And I went through about a half hour of, of this commanding and um, I didn't realize at the time, but there were a lot of different spirits that were coming out that were connected to, the, to that strong man of rejection. Mm. Um, because I had gotten, I'm telling you, after this experience, which was wild for me, you know, um, I can't explain the feeling, but it was almost the feeling that I had when I got saved. I felt so relieved and free that when I got home, my wife looked at me like this. She said, what happened to you? Your face is glowing. Hmm. I go, babe, I don't know what happened, but demons just came out of me. I don't know how this works. I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor. Like, I don't know what's going on here. You know what I mean? But I feel amazing right now. And I said, God, you're going to have to show me how this works, man. As a good Southern Baptist, you're going to have to take me to scripture. And, show, and I remember God clearly saying, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so I started, okay, okay, the temple. And for some reason, he led me to the book of Nehemiah. And I started reading Nehemiah. And at the end, when Nehemiah got the temple in order and set up, I went to fulfill his duties to the king. When he came back to check on things, the, uh, the priest had allowed... Um, Tobiah, an enemy, to live in the storehouse. Wow. Yeah. And the first thing hmm. that he did, right, Nehemiah did, was cast him out. You get And all your stuff out. I'm like, oh, my God, that's if I'm the temple, wait a minute. And then Scripture says, you know, Paul says, I want you to be sanctified in spirit, soul, and body. Oh, my gosh, there's three compartments. The temple is constructed with a, most holy place, a holy place, and a courtyard. I'm like, okay, I am the temple. This is how this works. When I get born again, I get a brand new spirit. I'm one with Christ. Holy of holies. Nothing can enter. It's going to die, right. right? It's guarded. It's protected by the word of God, right? Sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting between 
soul and spirit, bone and marrow. But my, my soul is the intermediate place that's being renewed, mm -hmm. right? So, oh, okay, so that's where I can get afflicted with an unclean spirit. And my body, obviously, I can get a virus, right? And one day I'm going to have a brand new body. So salvation is, is bigger than we think. Mm -hmm. It's not just being born again. It's, it's, it's bigger than that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so for me, that just opened the door. And then, and then rolling with Pastor Marco, like Pastor Marco, he learned deliverance being in the inner city and people are manifesting and God's showing him, you're going to have to cast this demon out. Mm. So he started reading John Eckhart and all, you know, um, and so he told me, start reading John Eckhart, Pigs in the Parlor. And so that started my journey of understanding deliverance and then beginning to, to more operate in deliverance. Yeah. So. I love your testimony. <laughs> Gosh. Thank you for sharing. It was a little again. chaotic because everything was like, ah. So yeah. I'm like, where, well, okay, where do I go here? It's been a chaotic here? stream, yeah. but I think we're <laughs> into like the, I think we're good now. I think everything's rolling. Are we for good? those of you that are just tuning in, um, because I'm probably going to have to cut some of this out in the beginning, as my good friend TJ, yeah. we got connected months ago and um, he's been kind of like a big brother in the faith for me and my husband, just discipling us, you know, got saved the same year I was born. We just have to bring up the elder thing again. So... <laughs> I want to say spiritual father, but I'm not ready to really, you know, however, you could be my daughter, honestly, like, yeah, well, I have kids your age, right. my, grand, my granddad. So, so, um, yeah, I just mm. love, love his testimony. Love that the Lord was so quick to answer the prayer that I had for proper biblical discipleship from someone who's just like on fire for Jesus. Yeah. And someone that would really relate to my husband and love on my husband, which you do and have done yeah. and continue to do. Um, and so, yeah, I've been learning a lot from you and you have explained. I saw someone in the chat say, never, never heard that before when you were talking about the book of Nehemiah, because you yeah. explain things in a way that I, I really haven't heard other ministers explain, but it's palpable yeah. and it's biblical. It's just like the context of the Bible. Right. So I guess like I would like to talk about deliverance with you um, because I have been the past like six months or so coming out of my shell about it Yeah. because deliverance completely changed my walk with the Lord. Yeah. Despite how many people would tell me like that's not you can't have a demon, you know, you're going down a wrong path. You're being deceived again. That's what I get a lot is that I'm being right. deceived again. Now I'm teaching people false doctrine and all these things. And um, hmm. yet yet i have had demons cast out of me and I, I i know you have yeah yeah oh yeah by the way everyone <laughs> I, I once threw up on tj just, just just for some context but that's real love man just, yeah but that it was the same thing with with that experience you had though when yeah. i was with you that um yeah that girl julia came up when we we're in Prop your house aside, and she yeah. just looked at me and said spirit of rejection that entered when you were 13 yeah get out and i just Bleh! like it just, yeah it just happened yeah um but yeah i mean yeah it's changed my walk with the lord and it's only brought me closer to him so when people are like that's not biblical i'm like well but the fruit is yeah like the fruit is there 100 percent. because the fruit before deliverance was more like lukewarm and right now it's just like I'm completely sold out. Yeah, there's just a why, lot of things people, you can't deny. I why mean, do people not like it or not believe But because it? it's been bad representation. Because the enemy's crafty and he's painted pictures and it's misconceptions and Hollywood. And and, and so I, I, I literally just finished a guide on deliverance. And it basically goes through just 10 steps. Um, and And the very first thing that you have to do is tear down the misconceptions biblically. Because mm -hmm. remember, deliverance is the power of the gospel. It is salvation, deliverance right. and salvation. Um, it's, but it, I like to say it's the salvation of the soul, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, the, it's part of the sanctifying process. Because mm -hmm. you're, you're always dealing with heaven and earth. There is a responsibility to deal with the physical. Um, I think strongholds are more attitudes, right, arguments, that it set itself up against the, the knowledge, knowledge of God, you know, those kind of things that they hide behind, that they work behind. That makes sense? Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you have to uh, understand that the, the power of the gospel deals with 
your spirit, your soul, and your body, past, present, and future. So it's, um, you know, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That word salvation, soteria, literally the definition is deliverance from the molestation of enemies. Wow. Right? So um, it's hard to deny. I mean, the, the key marker that Christ was different was his authority to command demons to come out. Right. Right. So um, it, to say it's not part of the Christian life is pretty rough. I mean, we just don't understand. And so we have to go back. Like I, like I said, step one in the West, we just don't understand context because the Bible is written to Jewish people. It's it, you, you have to understand ancient Jewish thought and idioms and, to really understand, you know what I mean? Um, we, yeah. you know, it's been watered down so much through the years, but you know, the gospel is from Genesis to revelation. So you have to have a supernatural worldview. I like to say, right. I listened to uh, Dr. Michael Heiser he, he, foundationally. If you want to understand scripture from Jewish perspective, the Old Testament, which I don't think you can really understand the New Testament if you don't understand your Old Testament. It, it's it's the foundation. You, you got to understand it. Yeah. Um, if you don't understand Genesis 1 to 11 in its proper context, you're not going to have the full power of what Christ paid for. Well, I don't believe. That a bit. So, and Dr. Heiser does an extensive work on this, right? He He's just amazing. But... In Western thought, we think depravity in life goes all, it just goes to the garden. Like everything uh, goes back to the garden. That's true. Okay. Because in the garden was brought in death. Death is the, the greatest enemy. It's the highest authority, right? Death. But what does that have to do with sexual immorality, theft, divination, you know, all, all the other things that bring depravity upon the, upon the earth? Did this, does this mean that just we just came corrupt because of death? No. So when you, when you look at Scripture and you go back to the very beginning and you see from uh, an ancient Jewish person's perspective, they're going to have a supernatural worldview. So Dr. Heiser talks about a uh, divine counsel wor worldview. Okay. So um, let me see if I can explain it in Genesis one in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So you're dealing with two realms, right? And so, um, you know, you got to understand there's other scriptures that talk about that allude to, God creating the heavens and what it might look like. It talks about the sons of God, the angels rejoicing, right? The, the, and so um, I think it's Deuteronomy 32 talks about uh, God and his divine counsel. In other words, he created a family in heaven to reflect him in heaven, right? And then his desire was to create a family in the physical. That would be us and they would all come together. Okay, well, that broke apart. Right. And I can go into detail and this is conjecture, but I, I think Genesis 1, 26 and 27 is key. And, and when God says, let us make man in our image, right? The word God is Elohim. That's just a blanket term for divine beings. Now that's why they say, um, have no other gods before me. God is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. He's the ultimate cre He's the creator. Make sense. Am I losing you? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So when he says, let us make man in our image, there's, there's theologians that say, oh, he's talking to himself. The Trinity's talking to himself, right, that's but, what I thought. but not according to De Deuteronomy 32 hmm. and other scriptures that say in Job, he says, where were you when I was creating? And the sons of God were rejoicing. Who are sons of God? Those are divine beings in his divine counsel. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, let us make man in our image. In 27, it says, then the Lord God made man in his own image. I think there's something there. What is the difference? They don't have the ability to be fruitful and multiply, recreate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so I could see how yeah. 
maybe some of those divine family went, got jealous and went, uh uh, we want to recreate. Right. And so one of those guys um, who was more crafty than the others in Genesis 3 brought the fall. Yeah. Okay. And so now you have a problem. You have death. And you read Genesis chapter 3. I can't get into all of it, but chap Genesis chapter 3 is key, obviously. Um, that's where death came in. God pronounces judgment, uh, but he also prophesies that the serpent um, would bruise the, uh, the heel of the seed of the woman, right? And that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, the seed of the serpent. So how does the serpent have a seed? There's an offspring, hmm. right? That's what it says. So then you venture on and Cain and Abel, and now you got murder. Now you have death. Okay, that's depravity, right? Now there's, a, there's tension here. But then you get to Genesis chapter 6, and you encounter a whole nother craziness, right? The sons of God. Who are the sons of God? They're watchers. Read the book of Enoch. It's history. It's not scripture, but it's history. It's context that they understood that we don't understand because we don't read the book of Enoch. We don't have the context. Mm -hmm. So when it says the sons of God, right, commingled with the daughters, they saw that the daughters were fair, and they came down, they rebelled and cohabitated with women and produced an offspring, which we call the Nephilim. Everybody's up in arms about the Nephilim, but, but it's real. It's in scripture. And so this is where, and you read Enoch, it talks about these certain uh, watcher angels that, that brought in divination. They brought in uh, war and metals to destroy each other. Like, this is human depravity, and it affected every gene except for Noah. Why? Because he's connected to Enoch, who wrote the book. Mm. So God's going to preserve the seed. And, he, and so why does he wipe it out with a flood? Because the whole world's infected with these Nephilim and, and all this craziness. So now you have a second problem, right? Okay. Then you encounter a third problem in Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel, another rebellion of the divine council. And then God disinherits the nations and raises up a nation for himself, the Jews. That's where the Messiah is going to come through, that seed. Does it make sense? That's why you preach the gospel to the nations, because here's the right. deal. The cross is reversing all three problems. Right. Well, the first problem is born again. You died eternally, right? Well, God reversed that. Christ reversed that. You get born again. Your spirit is new. Well, what happens about the soul? Hmm. Okay. And this is where unclean spirits come from. Hmm. The dead Nephilim. They have spirits. And Enoch talks about them roaming the earth. These are the ones that are able to inhabit. Am I tracking? Yeah. Yeah. And so we're not, we're not being possessed by a principality because there are still principalities and rulers See, when Paul talks about principalities and powers and those things, he's yeah. talking geographical. He's talking, he's talking Genesis 11 mm. because they do have dominion over nations. If that makes sense. Yeah. We're dealing with unclean spirits oh. that are afflicting and they're, and they're identified by their function. Derek Prince talks a lot about, about that, but they're assigned a function. If it's lust, if it's fear, if it's, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, and so, you know, when you talk about the types of Christ, look at this for a minute, okay? You have Moses as a type of Christ. He leads them through the waters. What's that? Baptism, right? Um, and delivers them from death. Angel of death. Okay? Now what happens? They get led into the wilderness. What's the wilderness? It's the place of the unclean spirit. Right? Now he's saying, go into the promised land. Okay, well, what's in the promised land? Nephilim. Wow. We're scared. We don't want to go in there. And, and Caleb is like, what? And Joshua, they're like, we'll go in there. We know the power of God. We're going to drive them out. What do you mean drive them out? Yeah, we're going to drive them out. Nope, but they wander until that generation passed. And then what happens is they tear the walls down, right? So now 
To me, this implies power over unclean spirits. Okay. Then you get to King David. Who's King David? He's the king of all the nations. See, Christ is going to come back and rule and reign in, in, the, in the place of David, right? As the eternal king on the earth. So, so that's, that's the last type. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I just, it's, it's, it's really, for me, I'm, I'm like an ex-Dauphine and like, you know, I'm not an educated dude. So I know this stuff in here. Sometimes it's hard to unpack it like a scholar because I'm not a scholar. I just, this is just stuff God's taught me. And so when, when you, um, you know, are dealing with people who are oppressed by the demonic spirit, they have to understand this stuff because it's revelation and it's the truth that sets you free. And if you don't have the, the, the full counsel, if you don't have the full gospel, the truth, then your, then your faith is, you're just like, okay, if you try so when people try to tell people the gospel, they're like, yeah, Jesus came, he died and rose again for your sins. There's no context underneath it. And we're just expecting because we said the words that they're going to get it and they're going to get saved. But if they understand from the beginning, the narrative, ah, okay. It makes a lot more sense. It helps build faith. It opens them up. You see what I mean? Yeah. Anyway. That's really good. Hmm. So, but you can you can do that without Enoch, right? Like you can come to those those conclusions without the Book of Enoch. You can. I, I, you know, it's just a shame that you know the the biblical writers read books. Peter quotes Enoch. Jude quotes Enoch. Like they have tradition. They have they have context right. that That's we don't say. have. Right. Yeah. You, you know what I mean. And so if we don't understand that context, then it doesn't make as much sense. Then we try to make right. things up like, gotcha. oh, those are the sons of Seth. Like you could say that, but it's not, that's a very weak argument. Right. You, you know, so it's like actually understanding the mindset of the authors. Right. hundred percent. Gotcha. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's like somebody coming to America that's never been in this culture they have to understand the culture to be able to understand why we do what we do. Mm-hmm. So that's right? like that's why you think deliverance is so misunderstood. So that's a, it's a part of it. Yeah. And and I think there's misconceptions. I think people feel like, you know, like Hollywood makes it seem like only the, you know, crazy people can be and possession. It's a bad translation like that. I, I just yeah. don't think that was a good translation. Like, look at the word. If you really look at the word, it doesn't mean possessed. It means demonized, right? So, um, daimonizomai does not mean possessed at all. Mm. Um, it can mean that you have one. Like, I have a virus. Like, nobody's ever ashamed when they get a deadly virus. Yeah. They want prayer. Yeah. They want to be set free. Yeah. Does that make sense? Right? So... I just, you know, so I, it's this picture that's painted that it's such an awful thing. How could I have this nasty thing in me? Well, how could you have a cancer in you? It's nasty. That's what I always say. People are like, you can't have a demon. The Holy Spirit lives in your body. I'm like, but you're, you're telling me that like, I, I could have cancer or I could have any virus. I could have any right. mental illness because I always find it interesting how like the same Christians that will say like you can't have a demon or the same Christians that like I have anxiety. I right. have depression. Right. I have, I have, I have like all these things that they still want to have in a way because they're right. continue to claim it. Right. It's like I just don't understand the logic of an unclean spirit can't live there because the Holy Spirit does, but the Holy Spirit will happily live with a disease that's killing your body. Right. It's it just, just doesn't it doesn't make sense. It just, or, or like at the same time, like the Holy Spirit will sit there and, and watch porn with you. Like if you're just going to sit there and sin and watch porn, like the Holy Spirit will sit there and do that with you. But a demon can't possibly be influencing that. Yeah. It's like they give so much. It's it's always just, it's well, it's just the flesh. It's just because you're the flesh. It's your, it's your flesh. It's your flesh. It's your flesh. So like, what do you say to that? When people are like, it's just a flesh thing. It's always just your, it's the thorn in your side. That's. I, I actually love what Isaiah says. Well, let's find out. <laughs> yeah, 
Let's put pressure on it. Let's let's have a little bit of faith, right? Let's mm -hmm. let's let's just say, okay, I don't want this there, right? How bad do you hate it there? Is there is it possible that that tormenting thought, that voice, what else, what else speaks? It's not you. It's not you, right? I mean, it has a voice. It's it's how much do you hate it? Let's see. Let's yeah. let's just put pressure. Let's pray. Let's call for the power of God. And if nothing happens, great. Yeah. Yeah. Keep repenting. Keep yeah. working. You know, I do I do believe sometimes people aren't ready for for deliverance too. You know? I mean, it's like I don't know, like there, there's because you have to hate you have to hate it because you have to come out of agreement with it you do so you have to re repent turn from because it, it does keep you in agreement with it and agreement means like this like i struggled with rejection um every time i was rejected i would take it personal even though i learned how to navigate around it it hurt right i received it now I'm like, I see where that's coming from. I'm not even going to go there. Like, mm -hmm. please. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very confident in who, who I am, where I'm at. I see what the enemy, he doesn't give up. Yeah. I see what the enemy's yeah. trying to do. Like, he'll bring people into my life that have rejection. And I see it from a mile away, mm -hmm. even if they, they don't recognize it. And I refuse. And this is what Pastor Marco did for me. Pastor Marco... I'll never forget this. He would always tell me, man, I feel that spirit of rejection trying to push me away from you and, and I ain't going to let it happen. And I appreciated that so much because nobody else could, could do that. They just thought it was me. And in myself, I'm thinking I would die for you. Wow. I am so loyal. Like I, my intentions are all great in my heart. Like why? That's why. Cause it's not you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, how do you know? So, like, how do you know when it's you versus a demon? Again, I think when there's patterns, when it, when it's a little bit beyond the norm, those are signs that, that you might want to explore that, mm -hmm. you know, cause it's never like I have a demon, like, man, I'm struggling with this tormenting thought. Right. I've been struggling with this perverted thought that just pops out of nowhere all the time. And I hate it. OK, well, let's pray. Let's command that thing to go. Let's bind it. You're going to renounce it, come out of agreement with it and and tell it to get out of your body. Let's go for it. Mm -hmm. You see, what I mean, and most of the time you'll get freedom. Some people manifest, some people don't manifest, but there's always a freedom when there's a spirit there. Mm. So, so, so then how do you maintain it? Because I know like some people get yeah. like addicted to it and that's not the answer either. Well, I, I like to say that deliverance brings you relief so that you can, that you can greater repent. It gets you relief to where now you, you're not battling on the inside as much. You know what I mean? It's like having a virus in your stomach. When you throw up, you can get it out. You know what I mean? It's expelling something out of your body. When you get bronchitis, you want to cough to get it out. Your body wants to get it out. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. It gives you relief. Now you got to care for yourself, right? Let me get it out. Ugh, I threw up. I'm not going to go eat a steak now. <laughs> yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, that's crazy. Um, so, yeah. So where does baptism play into it? Because that's, um. Yeah. you've told me a couple times that you won't or you don't think you know you should pray deliverance over someone until they've taken that step like why do you think that matters is it because what you were talking about before like in the old testament it's kind of like the formula laid out for like reversing the three rebellions well i think the first thing that god did was overcame death that's always the, the first place baptism is aligned with drawing a line in the sand to the heavenly realms it's it's declaring that this person is dying and they're rising to a brand new life to be born again. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so why would I go do deliverance first? I want to make sure that is done first. 
Right. Because I live with demon right. demons for I'm just glad I was saved. You see what I mean? So yeah. it's it's yeah. really a top priority. And it, this is evangelism. This evangelism, you know, is making sure that the gospel is being preserved, is being taught, people are being trained um, in the power of the gospel. That's what an evangelist does. That's me as an evangelist. It's not me that goes and just proclaims the gospel. Like an evangelist is given to the church for the equipping of the church. That's why I have people at my house. That's why I'm training people in deliverance. And the first thing I say is learn how to know if somebody's actually committed their lives, died to their old self, and have gotten... What's the sign? Jesus didn't say, ask me into your heart. I, I, I think there's value to that. But what he said was, baptize in the name of the Father, and Son, Holy Spirit. Make disciples of all nations, right? Baptize them in the name of... Why? Because that was kind of the, the action to take in your first step of faith. Mm. You get baptized in water. Mm. Then receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Be baptized in the Spirit. Get deliverance. Clean the soul. So then you can greater works of ministry. Yeah. You know, and this stuff takes discipleship. It, it's, you know, people think that, hey, I got saved. I got, no, it takes growing and discipleship. You know, when uh, Jesus and the guys went up on the Mount of Transfiguration and, and some of the disciples were down there doing a mission and they were bringing people to them to be delivered. And so when they came back off the mountain, there was a problem. Like the disciples couldn't cast the demon out of a child mm -hmm. and everybody was arguing over it. And Jesus was like, what's going on? And the dad steps up and says, hey, I brought my son to your disciples and they couldn't cast the demon out. Remember the story? Yeah. And so first thing Jesus does, obviously, um, is gets the kid delivered, right? Uh, and the next thing is that the disciples came to him and said, Jesus, what happened? Why couldn't we cast the demon out? And he said, well, it's a faith issue. And this kind of only comes out by fasting and prayer, and that kind of thing. My point is, when you're born again, you have intimacy with Jesus and his body, right? There's intimacy there. And you're working this thing out. Like we went after deliverance and we couldn't do it. Jesus, why? Ask him. Mm. Ask somebody in the, in the body who's filled with the spirit that he speaks through too. You see what I mean? It's his discipleship. That's yeah. part of discipleship. Yeah. Because so. Jesus could have done it alone, but he chose, yeah. to have, he chose to model it for us to have like 12 disciples. Our and original design is to be the image of him, right? So if we're in the image of Jesus, what did Jesus do? He preached the gospel. He cast out demons. He healed the sick. At least go after it. If you say you're a Christian, then we should be going after being like Jesus and doing what he did. What did he send his 12 apostles out to do? What did he send the 70 out to do? He said, "Obey my, teach them to obey everything I commanded you to do. This is what I command you to do. It's to the nations. We're, we're taking the gospel and we're redeeming back these curses. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you say when people are like, well, you don't really see it in the New Testament. Like Paul doesn't talk about casting out demons. But Paul cast out a demon. <laughs> Stephen cast out demons. Yeah. Okay. It's you, you see. What I mean, it's it's, just... uh, it's there. The thing is, we always try to look for a, a manual because we get religious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we it's... don't want relationship. God gives us enough principle, right? He said, if I if I wrote John said in John's gospel, if I wrote all the miracles and things that Jesus did, the the books. In the, of yeah. all the world couldn't contain. We just read that today. You see? And, and there was another part in John that really stuck out to me today where he says something, I'm like super paraphrasing, something along the lines of Jesus was telling them, like, when I go, you're going to have the Holy Spirit now and he's going to continue to tell you truth. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so the Holy Spirit does continue to tell us things and talk yes. to us and give us revelation. Like yes. He says it. It just says it. I don't, I don't understand. But, it, but it's always in the context of what is written. 
Yeah. It doesn't. I love Isaiah has a good understanding of this. It never con. It never con. It's yeah. never contrary well, it to scripture. Trust the spirits. Yeah. So yeah, it's you know, all there. Just because, um, you know, it's like Jesus doing healing. One time he would touch a person, they get healed. The other time he makes mud and you know mm -hmm. spits and puts it on their eyes, and they don't see clearly. Well, he does it again. You know, there's just it's vast. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about being in relationship with him and one another and growing in our authority because here's the, the, the deal. The scripture says that when we return with Christ, those fallen angels that cohabitated are in chains in Tartarus. They lost their domain. They lost their rights. Paul says, why are you going to court with people? Don't you know that you're going to judge angels? Mm. Right? Yeah. So believers... Or will one day take the place of those watchers in the divine council. It's powerful. Yeah, it really is. It's really a hope. We're not going to you know, float around in a cloud. We're not, <laughs> we have a purpose. Mm -hmm. and, and, and our discipleship aligns with that purpose. So we're not here because we want to live a better life. We want to have a bigger house. We have a greater future than that. We're royalty in the kingdom of God. We're being trained in the things of God to be who we're supposed to be, right? And, and when we die and rise from the dead and he returns, guess what? We have work to do. Mm -hmm. And we're with him. Yeah. All right. I have a couple more questions. Okay. Could you explain, um, I liked the little summary that you gave when you baptized Mike of what baptism is could you just explain that like how you explained it in peter again using the context of i think it was in peter the context of um having like the jewish backdrop and the understanding of that how what baptism represents is the burial and what ha what jesus actually did in that burial like why oh, he preached to the the spirits yeah because he he went he, he descended and he like he, he, yeah, it's, we have to look up that scripture. See, Mike, see if you could look it up. It's um, it's got to be in First and Second Peter. Um, look up baptism in First and Second Peter. Um, it gives you the whole the whole passage that, that that talks about baptism and him going to the heart of the earth, right? Preaching to those watchers who were in Tartarus, right? Who were in hell. I think it's First Peter three twenty one. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. Oh, is that it on the screen? Yep. So let's look at the whole. Okay, so it's First Peter. Oh, we're gonna do a Bible study. I love it. <laughs> um, see, here's the deal. We we need to study the Bible. Yeah. Right. We're disciples. You understand that, like, we don't read the Bible because we're trying to learn how to be better people. And we're studying the Bible to understand our position in the kingdom of God, keys to the kingdom of heaven. Like, there's, it's deeper, deeper stuff than we think. What, what did we say it was, Mike? First, First Peter 321. First Peter 321. Okay. Um. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formally did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal, appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven as the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been, sub been subjected to him. Um, it's a declaration, right? So the same way that Jesus went to the heart of the earth, made the declaration that you've lost, the curse is broken. Right. You have no more power. You know what I mean? And rose from the dead. 
you're making that same declaration to those those heavenly rebe- rebellious uh, spirits of darkness. You see what I mean? It gives you authority. It it it, it actually tells the, the the and you have to understand this when you're going into it. Right. That because the the spiritual realm they know if you know your authority or not. They know if you know what you're doing, if it's just a ritual, if it's just, but if they know, if you understand that when I go under this water, when I come back up, I'm going to be endued with power, right? In the name of Jesus Christ through this act. Mm -hmm. It's a very different. And I never heard it taught like that before, but it, it makes so much sense because I was always questioning why after my baptism because i didn't have that understanding like i thought like i was just getting baptized because jesus told me to like that was really the beginning and end for me which is enough but i didn't understand that authority so after i got baptized then like i backslid a lot Mm -hmm. and then that's when i needed my deliverance and it's and like when you explained it that way it made so much sense to me because it was like those spirits that i still had knew that i didn't know my authority and they were just they were just wilding out yep and is, that's exactly what it's it was, It's 100%. Right? But, and the interesting thing is, is look at Christ didn't need to get baptized, but he did um, because, because he modeled it, right? And, and what is the first thing that happened after Jesus got baptized? Where was he led? Into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So, you know, and I was telling Mike, like, bro, be prepared because... If Jesus got tempted after he got baptized, you're surely going to be tempted. So just be on guard. But what it does is it reveals bondages. Mm. So it revealed to you, okay, yeah, this is where I need to exercise authority. Wow. Yeah. And for me, you're was, done. Was, Get out of here. You know, it was marijuana, my eating disorder mm-hmm. and like the lust thing. It was like the last three things that I thought I had under control yeah. until I got baptized. Yeah. I mean, you can manage demons. People manage demons all the time. You're not possessed. I tell people all the time. People manifest on the altar and stuff. I say, stop. Bro, what's your name? John, you're not possessed, bro. Let me, let, let's me let talk for a minute. Then I'll talk to that person and identify what spirit is, is causing that. And then now we're working together. Okay, we're going to come against this thing. Hmm. And command it to come up and out of there. Let me, let's renounce it. Let's, you know what I mean? So I see people all the time on the altars and people are like, freaking out and they're like everybody's like yelling and trying to cast it out i'll just stop it wait a minute bro what's your name Hmm. my friend what's your name john or you know let's talk (laughs) you know what i mean you can you can stand against this okay Hmm. you have the spirit of jesus in you you can resist now does god want you struggling on the inside all the time no that's why deliverance is important but people do people go to their grave yeah. saved, born again, but still lived in bondage their whole life. And they didn't have to. And they didn't have to. So. Yeah. One more thing. Why do you think the enemy is so um, gung-ho to create such a division on this topic, in particular in the church, and create so much friction on this topic? Is it is it just truly as simple as because he knows it sets people free? Yeah, because he can't take um, he he can't take your salvation. He the only thing he can do is keep you from honoring and serving Christ mm. rightly, um, keep you from fulfilling your mission. That's yeah. you know what I mean, and that's a big deal. Yeah, um, because Jesus said to store up your treasure in heaven. Like he wants us blessed. He wants us to store up treasure in heaven. Uh, and the enemy doesn't want you to have zero treasure in heaven. He wants you going into heaven with nothing yeah. but your salvation, you know? Wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah. All right. I actually do have one more question. So what's one thing you'd like to see different? Like, what is your mission mm-hmm. as a disciple of Jesus? Like, what do you want to see different in the church? Because uh, I... I assume it's like you you just want to see people, you know, not because this is what the Lord's really put on my heart heavy. And, you know, people say I'm too I'm too young in the faith to like even speak like this. But it's what he's really put on my heart is that I just want to see the body of Christ like living 
like they're saved and not just like waiting for like the bell to ring to go to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll be really honest with you. I've been studying the Bible for many years. John 13 through 17 is without a doubt the most impactful portion of scripture for me. Primarily because in John 17, you really, really hear the heart of Christ, who is God, before he dies, before he leaves his, his group. And so you're like, okay, let's pay attention to a man's dying words here. And his dying words were, Father, he prayed for us, not just his disciples, but those who would believe. He said, I pray that they be one, even as you and I are one, that they be one that the world may know they're my disciples by their love for one another. Yeah. Intimacy is so technology, um, you know, all these devices really that the enemy uses to keep us superficial and separated is horrible. Like we go to church, we do our thing. We're faithful. But nobody knows what's going on in my life. And God forbid if I lose everything and my wife cheats on me and who's there for me mm. and I'm not being mean, but I'm just saying when that happened to me, none of my friends that I ministered to or Christian friends or leaders came to my rescue. The people that came to my rescue were some of the people that, um, the hard people like that wouldn't give their life to the Lord because my friend, Andy, who's a president of the Vagos, has done too much stuff in his life, but he loves listening to the word and he hopes one day to be saved. That guy comes to my rescue and goes, Hey bro, why don't you come to work for me? I'll make sure you're taken care of. I'll get you some money in your pocket. Like it's devastating. You know what I mean? Like we, when I was in prison and I read the book of Acts, it was the greatest thing I ever read because all I was looking for, because I grew up, my friends were everything. Because my, my house was chaotic, you know, my family was kind of messed up. I have, you know, they're good people, you know, took care of us, but but there was a lot of trauma there. So my friends were everything. But all my friends did drugs and were violent and you know what I mean? So when I get involved in church, I'm like, okay, this is cool. We can come to worship and sing songs of praise and all that stuff, but where is the community? And now, now we fabricate groups and we no, you want to make disciples. Look, when I met you. And I met you, right? Yeah, I was at an event and, you know, uh, prayed for your family member, prayed for you, blah, blah, blah. And then we connected and then God just dropped in my heart. You know, I'm doing something with this couple. You need to watch their back. You know, that's basically in my terms, how, how God said it. And I knew right away, okay, like they just moved here. I moved here three years ago. Like I never had somebody like that really in my life what a great opportunity to, to be there for them with whatever they need. You know what I mean? So I just think that's, I think that is closer to the heart of Jesus Christ than me casting out demons. Yeah. Love. If, if I'm being honest, love, yeah. I Faithfulness, agree. devotion to one another, um, representing our family in Christ. I mean, yeah. for God's sake, Jesus's earthly family came to the door looking for him. And he's like, who's my mother and my brothers? He looked around at those in that circle and said, this is my mother and my brothers. And I just have not seen that played out strong in the Christian church. But I do believe before Christ comes, that that's going to happen. So I'm passionate about my home, not just having home church. Like it's okay to gather in big groups, but I think it's important that we build community. What does that mean? Like Tyler's one of my best friends. Like we're totally, I mean, he's, how old are you? Young. He's young. Young. I'm 51 years old, like, you know, but, but he's very educated and very smart. I'm like streetwise, but we're just different. But our love for Christ is what totally glues us together. And we're together all the time. And we're like yeah. talking about changing the world for Jesus and yeah. stuff. And, you know, it's like, that's what it's about. Yeah. I heard, um, you know, I love Dan Waller. One thing I hear him Come say on. is like, he'll like bring someone up in the crowd that like does not look like him at all. And he'll be like, we look totally different, but we can both look like him. That's so just, good. Yeah. I just love that. Well, that's a good note to end on because yeah. it's true and it's missing, especially with like my generation with the internet. Yeah. The enemy, uh, it's like a, 
the internet is a cruel master, but a faithful servant. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, God's using it, but at the same time, I don't think yeah. it's his design. However, I do think that the next generation, your generation is hungry for relationship and community. That's why all the young adults I hang out with. Yeah. All right. Well, that was a great conversation. Um, we went, how, how late is it? Dude. Well, that, I mean, did you, did we count the 20 minutes of technical interference? Does anyone in the chat have any questions that you would like to ask TJ or myself? Chelsea, I really need help. Had a Kundalini awakening three years ago that has brought me into bondage. Wow, Chelsea. Yeah. You oh, know what? Do we want TJ to pray for the chat? Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Chelsea. Let's pray for the chat. Yeah, let me, I want to pray for Chelsea real quick. Chelsea, I want you to, I, I just, Father, I just thank you for Chelsea right now. Lord, thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're right there with her. And I praise you for her commitment to reach out and Lord, to share the truth. And so Chelsea, I want you to say this. I renounce that Kundalini spirit and I submit my heart to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I separate myself from that Kundalini spirit. And I command you, Kundalini spirit, get out of my life. And I want to pray. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. I speak to that kundalini spirit. In the name of Jesus, I command you come up and out now. Out right now in Jesus' name. Kundalini spirit, out right now in Jesus' name. You've been renounced. You have no more power and authority. Out in Jesus' name. Loose her in the mighty name of Jesus right now. Father, bless her right now. Holy Spirit, I pray you move into that wound, that soul wound that opened the door to that kundalini spirit. Father, I thank you for your grace on her life right now. Bless her in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Ooh. Thank you, Chelsea. I'm praying the breakthrough. Um, let me know if, if you experience anything, um, if you're able to walk through that. She's asking, do you have to burn occult stuff? Absolutely. Yes. 100%. It's biblical. It's an axe. That's what they did. They burnt like what? millions of dollars yeah. worth of their witchcraft, yeah. you have to burn the the occult stuff. Yeah. That is like a biblical instruction. Yeah, all the occult stuff is is technically what an idol is, okay? An idol is something that the spirit can attach to in the physical. So whether it's, if it's representing darkness and it's a physical idol, whether it be a book, whether it be teachings, whether it be an actual statue, whatever it is, you burn that. That's biblical. In the Old Testament, they would destroy idols. Those are considered idols. So anything related to the occult, crystals, any kind of physical thing that had to do with that, you destroy it. Yeah. That's, that's how you are making your declaration that you're breaking up, you're divorcing that for the sake of Christ. Yeah. yeah. Can jealousy be an evil spirit? 100%. Yep. Listen, spirits are identified, again, by their function. Uh, it's just like even in the angelic realm, uh, cherubim, seraphim, those are angels. They're protector of holy things, right? So it's to, even Jesus himself. Jesus means God is our salvation. He's identified by his function. He's the Savior. So in the spirit realm, it's the same situation, right? So you have unclean spirits that are identified by if it's jealousy. Well, how do I know it's jealousy? Because every time I get overwhelmingly jealous, it's beyond control. Okay. When it's beyond control, it's possible. It's a demon. Mm, yeah. And someone said, how do I get rid of my crystals? So I get a lot about this particularly because you can't like burn a crystal. Um, my friend's dad, the night I burnt all my stuff and I had my crystals with me, he took them all. He literally just took them to like a dump or like a compound or something. And people are like, well, that's bad for the environment. And my argument with that is that everything on this earth is going to burn anyway. And I think God would much rather you just get rid of it. Yep. Than try and preserve the, the ecosystem because let him take care of that. Okay. Yeah. Just get rid of the stuff. Like, just don't overthink. That's literally the enemy. It's like, oh, but if I do this to it, it's this, this, this. Like, that's literally the enemy trying to get you to keep these things. Yep. 
hundred percent. Just get rid of the stuff. Yeah. Like you don't need and anything that you feel a resistance to getting rid of. Yeah. That is more than likely like a, a spiritual bondage. <laughs> yes. Like, yes, I would say a hundred, a hundred times out of a hundred. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, guys, um, please consider partnering with partnering with the ministry as well. There's ways to support the show in the pinned comment. Yeah. Uh, become a monthly partner. So a one time seed, I have Venmo, PayPal, donor box is my most preferred, but whatever works for you works for me. Um, for those of you that don't know already, I am going on like a YouTube maternity leave. So the live streaming is going to stop in a couple weeks, God willing, whenever the baby's here. And I, um, you can actually start to see on my channel, I set up one video so far. So it's set up as a premiere. Um, and the rest of them, there's going to be like eight, maybe nine videos total for the maternity leave that are going to be set up as premieres. So they are going to premiere every Wednesday at eight, just like the live stream does. And I'm pretty sure that you can still interact in the, in the chat when it's a premiere. That was kind of my point of it so that y'all could still kind of watch like it is live, even though it's not. So yeah, I will be gone for a while, but it won't feel like I am because I will still be putting out content on Instagram and on YouTube. It's all there. If someone could drop my Instagram in the chat and TJ's Instagram as well. Um, oh, TJ, what are the names of your books that are coming out soon and when will they be out? Yeah, I have um, my life story. Really, I, f I finished uh, a book on that. There's a lot of good details in that. Um, and it's called The Little White Shed. And interestingly enough, Isaiah Saldivar, we had a meal together and I was telling him my testimony. He said, dude, you need to write a book called The Little White Shed. I'm like, that's what it is. And I didn't even tell nobody at the time. So I, I knew that was supposed to be the title. And so um, that is actually getting ready to be printed. Um, we have a full version and then I have a small version that can help people. Like if, if your family member, you know, you, you want them to accept Christ, it's that's kind of an aid to help. You get them to read that, read the story and how to give their life to Christ. And um, I have a small version of that. And then I just finished uh, a book called The Soul, Sh the Soul Shaker, and it deals with the 10 steps of deliverance. It's just a small book. It's instructional. It's, uh, you know, it's it's meant to help as an aid in deliverance. So Not to be confused uh, with the salt shaker. Not the salt shaker, the soul. <laughs> soul shaker. Shake up the soul a little bit. Uh, yeah, Genesis, it sounds like you need deliverance. People have tried to deliver me. Well... It is also part of the sanctification process. Um, people have tried to deliver you. That's a, yeah, we need some details on that to find out what's what's going on there. But um, I don't know that, you know, maybe you can email me. Uh, if you want to email me, um, you can also email me at tj at 777church.com. And, uh, you know, if you want to, my husband's putting that in the chat. Yeah, if you want right? to, if you want to, if you have a question that goes a little deeper, maybe tell me about your scenario, then maybe we can set up a zoom call or something. Um, is that and right? TJ. Yep. Yeah. Just, you could shoot an email to that, that, uh, email address. And, um, yeah, I'd love to try to help. If I could. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. That was fun. I'll have you back on after baby's here and I'm doing <laughs> this again. Yay. <sighs> All right. Cool beans. It was cool to hang out with y'all. Thank you for bearing with us with the uh, issues at the beginning. Oh, and I wanted to comment on one thing that somebody said at the very beginning that I saw, by the way, in the chat, that I don't ask a lot of questions <laughs> uh, to my guests and they wish I that I would. Um, okay, well, there's two things there. One... I like to let my guests speak because it's important to let them tell their testimony the, the way that they want to tell it. And then two, someone else said, maybe she's miserable from her pregnancy. Please don't speak death over me. I am oh, full of joy. Like I literally, I'm not <laughs> miserable. Like I feel great. This pregnancy has been amazing. I'm actually kind of sad that it's, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm so excited to meet my daughter, but like, I love actually this, this, like I love the belly. I love being pregnant. It's really fun. Um, 
just wanted to put that out there. Anyway, <laughs> go follow TJ. <laughs> um, get ready to buy his books. Someone said, oh, Mama Angela coming at you. <laughs> <laughs> get ready to buy his books. They'll be out soon. And um, yeah, hope. <laughs> <laughs> oh what's for dinner because i always tell them i don't i don't know yet i have chicken leftovers i'll do something with the chicken we'll see yes please consider partnering with the ministry emily dropped the ways to support in the chat again as well and please share share heaven and healing podcast on your instagram with your friends with your family um yeah all of the things okay look at how big i am Okay. <laughs> all right it's late it's late i don't know when, t when tj's bedtime is so we should probably go we should probably I know, i'm getting go. old the old guy's gonna get i'm up bed. i'm up until like 2 a.m every day so tyler too all right all right well thanks y'all this was fun we'll see you next time bye see ya <laughs> oh. wait the microphone's still on mike Bye. <laughs> <laughs>